are also live on Facebook. So we are now live in all of our locations. So if you're watching right now, this is the Bite Back Tour in the city of La Puente. Um, we are streaming live to YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and also our website. At any time you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and enter them into the chat. If you're watching on our website, we have a form right down below for you to submit any questions that you have and I will monitor for any comments or questions on my phone in front of me. Uh, with me, we'll start the introductions. My name is Levy Sun, Public Information Officer at the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. I'm gonna go ahead and go clockwise. Um, Allie, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Allie Gaspar and I'm the Outreach Assistant here at the District. And I'm also currently out in the field here in La Puente on the corner of Hacienda and Amar. Um, and so you can take in the view <laughs> behind me. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. All right, uh, going around the circle, Marco. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Marco Gaitan. I am the Vector Control Specialist 3 for the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito Vector Control District uh, and the Operations Department. Um, right now I'm currently in one of the neighboring properties to La Puente right here at the Pacific Palms Golf Course. I know it's not directly in La Puente, but it is right across the street from a lot of the properties right there. And uh, I'm sure there's some problems that are contributed from here. Very cool. And I know that with mosquitoes, they don't care about where you are. As long as there's blood and stagnant water, they'll go there. Oh, exactly. Uh, all right. Next up, we have Pablo. Hi, everyone. My name is Pablo Cabrera, and I'm the communication specialist here at the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. All right. Next, we have Carol Ann. I am the one of the education specialists at the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District, and I'm looking forward to being able to come back to La Puente Schools. That's right. And lastly, if you're available, uh, Jackie, if you're ready to unmute, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll draw you in soon. I know Jackie's probably getting set up right now. Jackie, I see that you're unmuted. Go ahead. All right, we'll come right back to Hello, you. This is oh, there you go. Go ahead, Jackie. Hello. Go ahead, Jackie. Yes, um, Jackie and I'm um, a vector control specialist one and I'm here um, in the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control Lab and I will be showing you guys a little later um, what we do when we collect traps from each city. So I'll be showing you that. Very cool. The suspense will build for us here. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is the Bite Back Tour in La Puente. I'm, and we're about to dive in there. But first, um, little fun fact about La Puente. La Puente uh, means uh, bridge or the bridge. And it's in reference to the bridge that was built uh, over the San Jose Creek um, back in 1940. So it, it's um, a really proper name for a city. And just like the bridge they built, we're trying to build a bridge into your community in La Puente by giving you the most uh, relevant and fun information about mosquitoes and mosquito control, including what we do. So let's start off with something else that's kind of fun. Um, today is World Bee Day, not the letter B, but the, uh, the buzz buzz bee. Um, it's really important that we stress this because we, have to be very careful with how we adapt to our environment as humans and what we use in our environment. We highly encourage everyone to reach for the stagnant water first before a pesticide can. To That way we can protect the biodiversity that is here in San Gabriel Valley. Anyone else want to add on to? Uh, I sure would, did? Levy, um, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, one of the things that we support is um, uh, native planting and landscaping with California native plants, because not only does it um, uh, conserve water usage, um, but it also provides um, vital food for uh, native pollinators. And so it's not just honeybees that are in trouble, it's actually all the native bees in, uh, too. And um, some of the other critters, um, there's beetles and um, uh, other types of animals, hummingbirds that are also um, are looking for nectar. And uh, so just, uh, you know, when you're, you're thinking about honeybees and trying to 
um, make the right choices as far as how to control a pest. Um, you know, that the more natural, the better. So natural landscaping and staying away from those broad spectrum pesticides. Absolutely. Great points. And All another right. thing I actually wanted to add to uh, that, uh, adding on to what Carol Ann mentioned also is, I think a common thing that we get is um, are mosquitoes good pollinators? Uh, a known fact about mosquitoes, they are, they are also nectar feeders. Male mosquitoes are nectar feeders. And while we might think that they may be pollinating, pollinating plants like bees, um, they don't. They're not very good at pollinating. So even the males who are just nectar feeders don't provide us much um, help in that department like bees do. Yeah, and, and the mosquitoes actually bite plants the same way they bite people. So they'll drill right into the stems of the plants to get um, plant juices. Um, so they're, they are primarily nectar feeders. The females, of course, are, you know, need a blood meal to produce eggs. Um, and I think there's one flower, it's like some kind of an orchid that is um, mosquito pollinated, but it's pretty, pretty rare to have any wow. plants that are like, you know, dependent on mosquitoes. So it's fascinating to hear that plants are as susceptible to mosquito bites as we are. We might have to yeah. uh, see if any plants need some repellent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they've come up with their own. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't even give them oil of lemon eucalyptus. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, let's dive deeper into the world of mosquitoes. To understand how to tackle them in La Puente, we need to figure out more about them, especially how they live and how they grow. Um, many people know mosquitoes as the, the ones that bite. So if you don't know already, only female mosquitoes bite and they bite us to use the protein in their blood to develop their eggs. Now, where they lay their eggs is pretty simple. It's the stagnant water sources around our home. And when the eggs hatch out, and as Pablo will, has shared on the screen, uh, they will grow into mosquito larvae. Uh, the larvae is what many kids may, may accidentally call tadpoles, uh, but they are indeed not tadpoles. They're not as nice and as cute, but um, in the water, this is what they look like. Um, Pablo, you wanna just describe a bit to me, uh, to the audience, what we're looking at here? Yeah, so here we're looking at mosquito larvae, and if you can actually see the difference in sizes there, uh, mosquitoes go through different, uh, uh, would it be molting, correct? Molting yeah, phases? That's right. Um, where they uh, basically shed the old skin and become larger, uh, and then each time they um, become different instars, uh, it leads them closer to become pupa. So there's no pupa in here yet. But uh, pupa, I saw one. <laughs> I think, oh, so that's the pupa casing. Yeah. Um, so the pupa is the final stage before they emerge into flying adults, which is what we're all more familiar. And if I can hopefully get one right here. Oh, There's wow. One. Look at that one. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So we got a male, oh, yeah, a male and, a and a female. Yeah. Cool. Hey, yeah. it's like they got the casting call and showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so Let's these are the obviously the mosquitoes were all more um more aware of but it's really like levy what you were mentioning is when we see them in stagnant water like this it's much easier to just dump this out and eliminate mosquito larva that way because each one of those guys right there is an adult mosquito waiting to emerge all right let's throw it out there to the group um, if i'm a resident i see this like wow this is disgusting <laughs> and cool but how then how often do I need to dump out the water? Do I dump it out monthly, weekly, daily? What's the timeline here? Maybe you'd have to do that once a week. Um, I'd recommend even doing it like on trash day since you're out anyways, um, you're collecting your trash, you're collecting your recycling. Um, just take 10 minutes each week just to you know scope out your yard and scope out your property and dump out all the water. Um, once you get into the habit of it, you won't even think twice about it. Very cool. Good tip on that one. Um, if you're just watching, we are doing a bite back tour in the city of La Puente. Uh, if you don't see already, Ali is actually out there in the field along with Marco. And we have Jackie, who's in our lab. Uh, if you're watching, you're probably watching on our website. If you are, use the form down below here to submit your questions. And I will monitor for any that comes through. If you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, go ahead and type in your question or comment, and I'll be sure to address those to our panel of experts and guests here. 
Um, let's move a little closer to our folks that work in our departments. Um, so now that you know that mosquitoes emerge from the water um, as adults flying around, well, most people think, all right, let's catch them and let's kill them. But for us, we need to use them as well uh, to gather data. And it's, it, I should be clear though, that there's no way to 100% eliminate all mosquitoes from our environment. There's always gonna be some level of mosquito population flying around. So we need to be able to detect that level of population. And that goes to our surveillance department. Uh, and Jackie is there um, actually in our lab. So Jackie, so clearly we can't, um, clearly we need to monitor for these mosquito populations out there. How do you do it? Well, what we do, um, if when we get a call, um, we try to do surveillance. And what we do is, and in particular, to try to look for West Nile virus, we um, put a trap in the area where we got a call, where we get a call, and then we use these gravid traps. And what they do, um, it's a, um, they seek um, mosquitoes that are gravid, which are the ones that are trying to lay their eggs. Um, and in these traps, we will collect uh, mostly the um, Culex species. And what we do is once we collect, um, I don't know if you've showed me trap previously, but inside the trap, it's it's um, a toolbox. And inside the toolbox, we have these containers and they're full of mosquitoes. And we'll put them about an hour or two um, in the fridge. Once we're done, and I have a couple mosquitoes here, um, we separate mosquitoes by female and male. And what we do, so we won't get mixed up, we will label each city. And what we do after that, we'll collect if you can see, this is just one site. Oh, wow. And there's a little marker, for example. This will let me know the site, the area, and then what day. And that's how we keep tabs. And what we do in our pool, in these vials, which we send out to um, run analysis, then the vials will have 10 to 50 mosquitoes. And again, they're all females and uh, we'll run them um, to see if um, there's any West Nile in the area. And we'll monitor that um, weekly. And from there, we'll be able to know if there's um, any type of virus in the area and see the, um, the amount of mosquitoes, see if um, the weather, seasonality, there's a difference, it goes up and down. If it does get progressively worse, then we do have um, our operations department, which will go in and take a look at any sources that might be contributing to um, this um, mess of, you know, control of populations. Uh, quick question, Jackie. So um, how many mosquitoes are in that dish that you just showed us approximately? No, about, about 200 here. 200, wow. Yeah. It doesn't look like a whole lot, but remember everyone, mosquitoes are super tiny. Uh, those giant so-called mosquitoes bouncing around your porch light, uh, those are actually crane flies. So if you do see those around, uh, don't worry about them. They're not going to harm you. They don't have any biting mouth parts, despite their name of being called um, mosquito hawks. So but yeah, about 200 in there. A quick then, question there, Jackie. Uh, you said you have about 200. How long was that trap out for? Oh, that's what I was going to go up for one night, just one night. Wow. 200 mosquitoes in one trap um, in one night. Now, right now we're in late May. So how's it looking out there for San Gabriel Valley in terms of mosquito populations overall? We are seeing a high number of Culex species. And um, when it does get warmer, we do tend to see the 80s population go up higher. On um, the last two, three years, we have seen 80 species already. Um, we, we, we already co um, collect um, small numbers, but for example, for the, this year, for me and the other technicians, we'll, we'll talk among us and then look at data. Um, we're probably getting one or two, the most um, out of 13 traps, 80 species. And we're pretty much can assume that it's due to the cooler nights. So when we're having the more humid nights um, and hotter days, we um, we will see more 80 species. So um, that's one thing that um, that we are looking at because there's other projects that we want to run um, in regards to 80 species, but we do have to wait when the time is right. Um, because again, out of, for example, last week, out of the 13 traps that I set out for a week, 
I only got 180 uh, mosquito. So um, in regards to that, we're doing low on 80s and um, Culex were, were about average, same last year. A little less than average, I would say, but because um, of the lower nights. So for those of you who just watching, uh, Jackie, who, who works in our surveillance department, just mentioned two different genera or groups of mosquitoes that are common here in San Gabriel Valley, and also in La Puente. Um, Culex is the, is the group of mosquitoes that are known to transmit West Nile virus. If you grew up in Southern California, you know these mosquitoes as the ones that come out in late afternoon or even at dawn uh, and they're biting you up. Um, but the 80s mosquitoes that Jackie just referenced are the ones that more people are very aware of now because of their very aggressive daytime biting behavior. And they also look a lot different. There are these little small black and white mosquitoes um, instead of the small brown mosquitoes. Uh, underneath a the microscope, they're pretty beautiful and they look really nice. Uh, they're just really bad when it comes to their biting behavior. Um, and then these 80s mosquitoes are responsible for many diseases worldwide, including Zika or spreading Zika, dengue fever, yellow fever, and my favorite word to say chicken gunya, because it sounds like an exotic chicken dish, uh, mm -hmm. but it does not, it's not as delicious as you would think. <laughs> um, so Jackie, thank you for sharing with us um, what you do with the traps and how you count them and, and bring them on board and basically create data. Since we are a data-driven public health agency, now let's talk about where that data goes next into communications and also operations, which uh, Marco is actually representative of today. So Marco, um, you see the data come in saying now we have you know X amount of like 200 mosquitoes in this trap in that area, what next? Oh, hi, Levy, and hello, everybody. Yeah, so when we get that information from surveillance, uh, typically what we'll do is we'll go out to these areas and, you know, try to identify if we have any active sources um, or see if there's any sources that, you know, maybe, maybe we made inactive. So we'll go to and activate those as well. I'm just going to take a look around the area and see if we can identify any problems on um, maybe see if we need to do any treatments and in these sources. Uh, like a good example is right now where I'm at right now is... Pacific Palms golf course right here in City of Industry, which is parallel to La Puente. Um, historically in the past, this area has come back with some pretty high trap counts. Uh, so this area that I'm actually in right now is probably one of the, you know, the hottest breeders, I would say here in uh, at least that I had when I was in zone six, which is, uh, which is what La Puente is a part of. Um, so I can kind of actually show you a source if you guys want to see uh, where in the past I've had to do several treatments. All right. Field trip. Um, <laughs> Give me a second. All right, here we go. Can okay, let me know if you guys can see this. Oh yeah, yeah. What, that's it, all good. What are we looking at? So this is a wash drain. Um, so since this, since this golf course actually has several like ponds, um, this is where all the overflow goes into. Um, so you have this area right here on the left that comes in from the undergrounds, and once it you know fills up, it goes over this little ledge and into this sort of like pond right here. Uh, the thing is that the water stays here for you know, a little bit longer than we'd like it to. So we start to get these areas where we get tons of breeding. I did take a dip. Hopefully the video quality is good. So you guys can see it. Um, I have it right here. You can kind of see them swimming around right there. Oh, wow. Yeah, let me see if I can get them to move around. Uh, but yeah, this is just pretty common right here in this source. If anything, that's a low level breeding to what I'm used to, at least when I used to oversee this area. Um, so, you know, our job is to come out here and make sure that we can treat these sources properly so they don't become a, a nuisance and there's no likelihood of any sort of virus transmission. Um, and then not just for this side, this goes for any sites that we have, whether it be, you know, as little as a small one square foot drain on someone's property to these larger areas that are hundreds of square feet that we have to treat for. So, you know, we make sure that we use the correct pesticides that we're rotating them and that way we have no, you know, chemical resistance to any of these pesticides and that way we can try to keep these populations down. Very good point you brought up with the uh, pesticide resistance. It's a big deal in just in mosquito control. The you know, last thing we want is for the resistance to build up in these populations and we can't treat for them if there's a public health emergency. Um, so yeah. Right. And that's a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's kind of one of my things that I try to champion uh, in the classroom is that, um, you know, anything the homeowner can do to, to keep from um, perpetuating that problem with resistance, which is basically just a form of natural adaptation, 
um, when you have some sort of a challenge like a pesticide in an animal's environment. Um, you're actually, when you're using that pesticide, you're selecting for those individuals that will be resistant. So the way we get around it is by rotating those products and those uh, um, control measures. But um, if you just, you know, as a homeowner go down and on a regular basis, use a broad spectrum pe pesticide, you're actually, um, you know, selecting for those insects that are going to be resistant to that pesticide. So the more you use it, um, you know, the worse the problem is going to be. So just, you know, word to the wise, um, save your money and use non-pesticide uh, ways to control those in your backyard because uh, um, that's usually works better over the long term. Speaking of saving money, we're going to have a couple more tips for everyone watching regarding how you can save your money in regards to repellent and what to look for. Uh, but yeah, great point, Caroline. If you're just watching this, the Bite Back Tour for La Puente, uh, we are streaming live to YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, and also our website. If you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and add them to the, the comment box, either below or to the side, and we'll, we'll monitor it and send them off to our experts here who can answer them for you. Uh, for those of you who are our special guests in the field and in the lab, if you do need to jet, no worries. We understand you have a very packed schedule. Uh, but let's talk a little more about the sources in general, because um, everyone just saw Marco showing us a very public source that we have easy access to that we can get control of if needed for any mosquito issues. But what about the sources that are on private property? That's out of our realm usually because they're so much harder to reach and the sources are much more tiny. Um, Y'all remember we mentioned 80s mosquitoes. These are the ones that bite you very aggressively during the daytime. Well, they, lay, they also lay their eggs uh, individually on small containers that may hold stagnant water, or even on plant stalks that can hold stagnant water, which means it's all the more important that we need people to do their part around the home to get rid of stagnant water or even the container. Uh, so mosquitoes will emerge from stagnant water or they will grow in stagnant water um, in their life cycle. And you wanna interrupt that life cycle before they actually emerge out they breed and they continue that life cycle. Um, I just wanna throw out there a question to folks who worked in the field. What are some of the strangest sources you've seen, stagnant water sources? I'm sure a couple images must pop into your head. I see you smiling, Marco. <laughs> uh, it's funny, one of the actually early sources that I went to when it was 80s, I was in El Monte, uh, and it was just, you know, a large property, a lot of miscellaneous stuff on there. And, Come across a bowling ball thinking oh that's nothing so let me just flash my light inside the you know the, the where you put your fingers through and sure enough right when i got close to that bowling ball the adults flew out and i look in there and there was all stages of breeding um so to this day that one still always sticks in my mind and every time i go onto one of these residents properties when i'm trying to advise them to you know to tip over all any stagnant sources and you know eliminate or you know possibly toss them away if they don't need them I always just bring up that bowling ball because I just let them know, hey, you know, it takes that little amount of water where I can see that into there. That's a, that's a really funny, I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> that's a yeah, great, I wish I, I'll I, have to remember that. I wish I would have taken a picture, but it was just, it was just so funny. One of the very first, I think it was my second weekend and sure enough, I'm like, oh, this is a, this is a problem. <laughs> so, so how far did you have to roll that bowling ball to get the water out oh no <laughs> i should have used it <laughs> yeah um any other sources people have seen that's bizarre or different yeah levy i actually um i haven't well had an abandoned a lawnmower that just stopped working and um sure enough i you know it was breeding in the little indents um of the little lawnmower basically so i was completely surprised had completely forgotten about it and till this day like i think that it's just the strangest place to hold water like you it's very unassuming like marco had said and then it just sticks in your head i think that's a <laughs> thank you for sharing another one that comes to my head is uh one of the property inspections i've done in the past Include going to a property that was, it was after one of the major holidays. I think it was either Cinco de Mayo or Memorial Day. I can't remember, but we went onto the property about a week or so after the holiday weekend. And I was looking through their recycling bin and I saw a lot of beer cans that were opened. <laughs> a lot of them were empty, uh, but some still had beer in there. But there was also some early rains that had occurred uh, that week. So looking in some of them, I thought there's no way I would find mosquitoes in this beer water mixture. 
But it turns out in many of the cans, uh, it reeked of beer, but there were mosquitoes swimming around inside the beer. I mean, I don't, I can't tell if they were inebriated. I couldn't see they were <laughs> swimming in a straight line. Uh, I couldn't do sobriety tests on them, but I know that they were clearly having a blast in those beer cans. So if you have any recyclables out there, make sure you just cover it all up. Uh, that way you don't have any uh, drunken mosquitoes um, <laughs> teetering around <laughs> in there. So uh, when we do the uh, the citizen science um, um, uh, vector inspectors, the kids often mark on the sheet, you know, where they found their water. And I've had all kinds of crazy ones. An old shoe was one that was reported to have been holding water. A suitcase was another one. Um, oh, a, a suitcase. Yeah. That, that, you know, if it's open and it's filled with water, it's going to you know, grow. Um, kids are always surprised to hear that um, we have found mosquitoes growing in bottle caps that uh, consistently hold water. So it doesn't really have to be very much at all. Um, so I just tell the kids, you know, make sure that um, anything, any item that is not supposed to be out there and not supposed to be holding water is, is taken care of, recycled, you know, stored somewhere safe or in dry or uh, thrown away. But um, that's one of the things that we do with the schools and La Puente Workman Elementary was uh, involved, the entire school was involved in doing a vector inspector where they go and uh, um, check their backyard for sources. So we show them, you know, all the possibilities and where to look. And the kids, you know, are really great at spotting that stuff. So if you've got kids or grandkids, um, that's a really good activity for them to do out in their backyard is to um, just look for items that are holding water and get that water dumped out and that item put away, uh, recycled. Um, so we have uh, in the fall, we have our uh, uh, community or citizen science programs, both um, vector inspector and um, uh, operation mosquito grid. So if there are any teachers listening, give us a call or we still have some spaces open um, for classes or schools that wanna get involved. Um, so that's uh, vectoreducation.org, and we'll give you that uh, link uh, later. You are reading my mind, Karen, because as, as I was talking about the sources, I knew that your curriculum deals a lot with teaching the students how to look for these sources and what to do about them. And, and, as, got... and there's the, some Workman Elementary students. It's been oh, cool. a, f yeah. a few years since we took that picture, right, Pablo? I think you yes. were the one who took that. that so. is great. They were yeah. awesome. Yeah, they were just fantastic and, and just great at, you know, they brought their samples back in and then we reported to them and showed them um, images of what we had seen in their water. And so not only did we find um, mosquito larvae, but lots of other um, aquatic uh, um, micro in, uh, invertebrates. So, you know, they learned not just about uh, mosquitoes, but also some of the other things that are found in their backyard. So it's a really nice, comprehensive, fun pro project for them to do. And, you know, no work for the, for the teachers other than to, um, you know, just call us up and, and make an appointment. So uh, I think we can, thing there. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, this is something that we can do, you know, virtually as well. So if you're still doing a hybrid program this fall, um, you know, we can, we, we ha can accommodate that. So I don't think we can stress this enough. If you're a teacher, you don't do any work uh, when you book us. We will do the work for you. Sit back, relax. You've had a terribly long year. Uh, we're here to help you out. Uh, so I, I wish I had this when I was a student. And yeah, great, um, I, great opportunity to do some, you know, hands on science and, um, you know, help out the community as well. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of the Workman Elementary students that we saw pictured there end up uh, somewhere in our industry working with mosquito control or public health. Yeah, we definitely have, you know, when we do the, are going to be back in and have the high school kids involved in the water analysis. You know, in the past, I've had a uh, usually several from each group saying, you know, I'm really considering getting into, um, you know, public health and vector control because they were just really fascinated by all the aspects of it, so... Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's a fun experience. So if you're just tuning in, this is the Bite Back Tour in the city of La Puente. Uh, we have Ali, Jackie, Carol Ann, Pablo, and Marco uh, joining us here. 
If you're watching, you're probably on our website, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. If you have any questions or comments, please add them to the comment box, either on the side, below, or above, wherever the comment box may be on the platform you're on. We just wrapped up talking about some of the um, great resources for teachers, uh, how we teach the students about where to find the water, get to learn more about the threat. They also get to learn a little, a little bit about um, the, the habitat in which they live in, which is in the cities, the suburbs, or, or in the urban area, and maybe how plants may play a part in mosquitoes uh, in their neighborhood, and especially dense vegetation. And as I want to get into that really quick before we dive into repellents, because I know a lot of you are just waiting for the talk on repellents. But in terms of dense vegetation, I will dispel the myth right now. No, mosquitoes do not emerge or grow in dense vegetation. However, they will use the cool, uh, humid underside of leaves to rest, and they will stay there during the day when it's really hot in La Puente. Uh, so that's why plants like ivy uh, are definitely one of those that you want to try and get rid of or scale back. If you're, oh, Pablo just shared an image of Jurassic Park. Oh, no, that's not Jurassic Park. It's a, it's a front of a house. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Jurassic Park looking house. Yeah. You do not want your, your yards or your patios to look like this because you'll be inviting a lot of adult mosquitoes to rest there and they will obviously bite you up if you're there. Um, so scale that back. Let's go ahead and uh, before we wrap up this tour, let's talk about repellent. One of the favorite things about repellent discussion is actually not the repellents themselves, but all the myths about repellents. So I'm gonna throw it out to the group as to what kind of repellent myths that you've heard and maybe uh, ways we can correct that. So I'll start. Um, dryer sheets. Uh, I've heard people say you should use dryer sheets to rub on your skin, on your arms and, and your neck and your face. Tuck them in your hat and you'll be okay. Now, you'll be okay for probably a couple minutes as the dryer sheet does kind of veil the scent from your skin. But as you sweat it off, as you breathe out your CO2, Mosquitoes will find you. Any other myths people um, have heard of? I always think of um, the repellent shirt that my mom bought and um, she swears by it. It doesn't work and it's actually a dark color which attracts mosquitoes more, um, but thankfully she got rid of it. The thing I talk to the kids about are the bracelets and the uh, pendant um, repellents. Um, they, only protect one small area, you know, the area around your wrist. And in the commercials, I, you know, they always show this sort of invisible shield appearing around your body that the mosquitoes, you know, bounce off of. Well, that is not actually accurate at all. And um, the mosquitoes, there is no invisible shield. And a little bit of a breeze is going to move any kind of um, repellent uh, you know, usefulness away. So, um, and that the same goes for these citronella candles, you know, a candle in the middle of the table is not going to be enough to protect your entire body. So the, the best thing to do is just get something directly on your skin right. and then you don't have to worry. Yeah. If mosquitoes can survive through the dinosaurs and up to us, they can survive a citronella candle. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have one last one here. Uh, it may break some hearts. Sorry, La Puente and those watching around San Gabriel Valley, but those menthol rubs like Vicks do not work. <laughs> I've heard many times that they'll use Vicks to get rid of the mosquitoes around them or treat the mosquito bites, but they definitely don't repel mosquitoes, unfortunately. All right. What about uh, what about eating a lot of garlics? Which oh, is yeah. one of the <laughs> yeah, that's one of the ones that the residents that. told me. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's not enough scientific research to say that garlic uh, consumption will repel mosquitoes. You'll probably repel a lot of people, um, but probably not mosquitoes. And it all comes down to body chemistry and how everyone's a little different. Maybe it could work for a small group of people, but for the vast majority of folks, uh, you're just rep repelling uh, people around you with your garlic breath. Now, Levy, don't we have the, the, the four... Uh, CDC yes. recommended ingredients on our website. Do we have that on our we website? We do. We do have four uh, recommended repellent ingredients that have an EPA registered and recommended by the CDC and all public health officials. Um, and 
uh, we have DEET, which is the gold standard. Uh, if you're not a fan of DEET, there is now oil of lemon eucalyptus, also known as PMD. Which is so, a botanical. A lot of people are very, you know, botanicals are very popular. So there you go. There's yeah, your a lot more options. companies are coming out with uh, these botanical ones, especially with oil of lemon eucalyptus. Yeah, you have to be sure to read the label, though, um, you know, and just take, go with the recommendation. Uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus, you don't want to put it on very young children. Oh, yeah, I think it's under three years. You do not mm -hmm. want to put on and make sure yeah. you consult with your pediatrician. Um, we have Picaridin and IR3535. So if you're walking down the aisle and you're in a rainbow of marketing products trying to sell you the latest and greatest in terms of repellent, go bypass all the fancy design, the flashy foil boxes and pick up the bottle and look at the ingredient. Uh, Levy, anyone... what's the other name for oil of lemon eucalyptus? There's another designation. It's uh, PMD. PMD, is the other, okay. uh, designation that it has. So if you're looking for something botanical, PMD or oil of lemon eucalyptus will work. All right, any other last thoughts on repellent before we move on to closing uh, um, statements from folks? Just to say that if you use repellent, you know, you can be outside, you can be gardening and, um, you know, it just takes a load off your mind worry, you know, you don't have to worry about that uh, risk of, of West Nile. And then also, oh, sorry. All okay. right, uh, Jackie first, and then we'll go oh, there. How, how about those lights that um, people put around their... Um, their doors or even where they're lounging outside. Mm. Oh, the, the, like, the, the, bu the bug zappers. Yeah. yeah, no. No, unfortunately they don't. Uh, in fact, um, I remember going through one neighborhood in, uh, in near La Puente and they had a lot of them bought these bug zappers. In fact, Pablo and I popped open quite a few of them to inspect those things. And it turns out none of those bug zappers had any mosquitoes. In yeah, them. they kill a lot of beneficials and non-target mods and things like that. And yeah, that's not good. And even if you buy the ones that have the, the CO2 lures that lure in the mosquito, um, you're probably helping out your neighbors and your neighbors love you because you're bringing all the mosquitoes into your yard. So uh, if you're trying to trap your way out of mosquito problems, it's not like them that everyone does their part. Um, so to make sure you dump out the stagnant water, whether wear the repellent, and also if everyone participates in using those uh, lure traps. But if one person does it, it's no good. All right, let's move on to closing statements. I'm gonna go ahead and throw it counterclockwise this time. Um, Marco, any last words for our residents in La Puente? I, you know, just make sure that, you know, you're tipping out the water, you know, weekly, make sure that you're tossing away any unnecessary containers and, you know, just protect yourself when you're out there. Uh, like right now, I've, I've been kind of looking around and I wish I would have worn repellent. Uh, so I have my hands stuck in my pocket and I rolled up my sleeve or rolled down my sleeve. So, you know, just make sure everyone's being protected out there. And like I said, just try to get rid of that water. Very cool. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Pablo. Uh, just kind of reiterating off of what Marco said, I think an important thing uh, especially for residents to know is that we as uh, the Sanger Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District, we are keeping uh, a close eye at public areas like where uh, Marco's at. But the most important thing is to be keeping an eye on your property when you're out throwing out the trash, giving a quick scan of your yard and getting rid of anything that's holding water. Something as small as a bottle cap is all mosquitoes need. So that's really important that keeping that consistency and eliminating any stagnant water. Very good. Uh, Caroline. Uh, get your kids, grandkids involved. Um, you know, they are, they are really uh, want to help out. And so, you know, get them out there dumping that water out and, and putting that stuff away. And um, you know, uh, the kids are everything. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And they will also shame you endlessly <laughs> if you don't do it right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Jackie, any last words for our La Puente viewers? Yes. Um, just a awareness. It, you'll be surprised um, the lack of information or, or knowledge um, that's so basic that people just will mix up or just aren't aware of. Um, just by, if you do hear someone that's going to go on a hike or just basic information, summer's coming up, um, just give that knowledge and that's enough for someone to spread the word and okay, yeah, you were right. I, I dumped out that bucket and my, I can enjoy my backyard just as basic as, as refreshing them. It might be that they got 
the information wrong, just spreading the word and it helps out. You help out that person, that person will, will continue doing the same thing forward. That's right. Pass it forward, especially knowledge. Very good. And then finally, Ali. Hi, everyone. Um, just to play off of what Jackie was saying, now that it's also warmer, um, to also make sure that you're applying mosquito repellent over your sunscreen. Um, it's important to wear sunscreen also. And similar to sunscreen, you would want to reapply it as the direction label says on the repellent bottle. And also, you guys with me, I have um, just a visual reminder to tip and toss. Um, these are also some sources that you may find um, in your backyards or out in the public somewhere. Um, you might find them specifically in like bromeliad, these leaves or plants similar to this, retain water in the leaves. And then also in children's toys, as Caroline has said, to make sure that you get your kids involved helping you out in the backyard. Um, and then also when it comes to um, repellent, just to make sure that you reapply as it says so. Wow, thank you for sharing that, um, Ali. In the field too. <laughs> Uh, so thank you all for watching. This is the Bite Back Tour in La Puente. Everyone, please stay healthy and stay bite free. <laughs>